Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains that's in Missouri in the USA. Today, we're taking a look at the world's first laptop, the Epson HX20. This was a donation from a very generous viewer and it boots up, but the LCD is almost unreadable. It comes with the expansion unit and I was also able to pick up this factory service manual on eBay, which I've scanned and I'll put the link to below. This is a very interesting unit. It is quite small for something that came out in the early 1980s. It has a nice full-size keyboard, a built-in micro cassette recorder, a built-in printer, and a four line by 20 character LCD display. Let's start with an overview of the entire HX20 system and then we'll dig into this guy and see if we can't fix that pesky LCD problem. Let's get started. Here are just a few of the circuit boards I've had made recently by PCBWay, who is nice enough to sponsor this video. So whether you need a few boards or a lot of boards, check out PCBWay. Jump on over to the PCBWay website and get your instant quote on standard circuit boards, advanced, flex, they even do assembly, and you can get stencils made. For your next project, check out PCB Way. It seems Epson's primary target was the business executive on the go, and this is very similar to other portable computers at the time. With the built-in printer and micro cassette storage, it was really a full-featured mobile computing device. They also offered an acoustic coupled modem as well as an external floppy drive unit. A video interface unit was also planned, but it was never released. And like other computers of this era, it was sometimes pressed into service as a data logger or controller for scientific apparatus. This is a very interesting little computer. The keyboard has a really nice feel. Full-sized, full-travel keys, cursor buttons, function buttons, etc. See if we can get a close-up on this LCD so you can see what the problem is. Let's turn it on here. You can hear it kind of has a Roger beep and we can see something has come up on the screen. Even if I adjust the contrast, See, it's not really coming up, so it's super visible. Even uh, viewing it with the eye instead of through the camera, it's very difficult to see. You really have to get kind of this sideways angle on it. So we'll take a look at the power supply here. There's a power supply that generates a 7 volts for the LCD, and then there's the circuitry for the contrast pot that changes that. So we'll take a look at all of that. The base unit is this part right here, and this expansion unit is an add-on. It plugs in and it's got a couple screws that go up through the bracket that hold the two together. The printer is inbuilt. Originally, this would have came with a blanking panel here, but you could buy this micro cassette as an option. There's a little release handle on the back here, and this just slips right out. Isn't that an interesting idea? See the little catch here? And just snaps right back into place. You look at the right side of it here. You can see we've got the power switch, the contrast knob, which they're calling the viewing angle. This is the eject for the cassette. Here we have the connections for an external cassette recorder a barcode reader, a reset button. Along the back here we have the cartridge eject, which is what ejects the micro cassette recorder, and you could also potentially plug other things in there. In here we have the adapter connector for plugging in the charger, RS-232C, 
and a serial port, which is also RS-232 signaling levels, but it doesn't have all the handshaking signals. And on the bottom of the unit, you can see how the expansion unit is screwed into place. There's a little trapped door right here with a metal cover where you could add in additional ROMs for like language localization and things like that. It's very interesting in the manual, they give you all these cautions about how you shouldn't take this apart to put in new ROMs. You should have the factory trained service technicians do that, although they tell you how to go about doing it. Oh yeah, it even says on this sticker on the back here, caution, don't do this. We have another flap here which lets you access the main ROM chip. So I think our first port of call will be to remove this expansion unit and then take out the six or seven screws along the back here that hold the bottom half to the top half so we can get in and have a look at that LCD power supply. Now the factory service manual didn't go into great detail about how this expansion unit connected. So I am guessing that the idea here is we remove these four screws and those brackets don't appear to flip up there but maybe we can slide this apart now yeah there we go you can see that is the epson h20 eu expansion unit this adds 16 kilobytes of ram and you can plug additional roms into it now we're left with these brackets sticking out the side here Oh, okay. There's a screw here and a screw here to remove those. It's usually easier when trying to test something new to take it down to its most basic unit. That way you're limiting the number of potential failures you have to troubleshoot. Now there are a series of screws around the periphery here. And you notice that we're missing a couple feet. I'm missing the ones at these corners. These kind of have a weird knobbly texture to them. The screws that hold the expansion unit on are shorter than the ones through the back cover. According to the service manual, we want to rotate this up like this disconnect this connector and this looks like it has ears on the side here yes it does there's little ears here so I'll flip up these ears slide that guy out okay oh that guy slips right out of there let's take him out just open this like a book. So now we have a good view of the inside. We have the LCD board here. This is the printer access where the paper comes out. The keyboard. This is where that cartridge port which has the micro cassette in it is located. Under this cover is the main board which the manual calls the MOSU. M -O -S -U. We have the printer unit itself, the NICAD battery pack, which is four sub-C batteries wired in series, and the battery pack plugs in right here. I'm sure this battery pack is dead, but luckily we can plug in five volts right here and test the rest of the system. And this guy even has a fuse on board. Now our power switch is actually located here on the keyboard, as well as the viewing angle for the LCD. So I'm thinking we should go ahead and remove this cover off of the main board after unplugging the battery pack and try to locate where the power supply circuitry is and test the various voltages. There's only a couple screws that hold this RF shield in place, but you also have to remove two screws from the printer and take the printer out to get the shield out and release the printer connector. I tested the battery and I was pleasantly surprised it was showing 5.1 volts and after looking at it this is an aftermarket replacement so this may yet uh, still be good. 
And I'm also quite pleased to find that there are test points on here for various voltages accessible from the back. And they even went to all the trouble to silk screen the back of this so you can test it without having to take it all the way apart, which is quite handy. Now, after comparing uh, the service manual, some of the schematics in there to the back of this board, I located the 2C inverter chip, which is part of the seven volt power supply for the LCD, which is right here. Right here is C5, excuse me, C2, which is in that circuit. Then I got to looking at those capacitors a little closer on the back. Yeah, so here we can just start seeing some corrosion even on the back of the board. And this is quite evident with the lighted magnifiers on several of the capacitors. So we'll have to pull this Mosa board out and have a look. To pull the Mozu board out, we need to unlatch these two connectors to separate the keyboard half. And there are a few screws located around the board that need to come undone. So we'll go ahead and do that and then carefully lift this out of here. Now, I believe we have all the screws out of there. I believe we should be able to lift this Mosa board out. Tilt it to sneak it out of there. Let's take a look at our Mosu board. First, we have the main CPU, a 6301. You can think of this as the operating system CPU. It takes care of things like the keyboard and the LCD and running your programs. Then we have the slave CPU, which does things like controlling the cassette, the printer, and provides the RS-232 serial interface. The two microprocessors share a serial link where they communicate at 38,400 baud. And of course, we're going to need some memory. So we have 16K of built-in static RAM, which was quite a lot for the early 1980s. Of course, we also need some ROMs. There are four ROMs built in, and the empty socket you see on the left is for an option ROM. We also have a built-in real-time clock chip, so the computer always has the correct time and date. For a serial link to the outside world, we have an RS-232 driver and receiver chip to handle the voltage level changes that are needed. While most of the computer is powered directly from the battery, we do have a voltage regulator that handles generating the 7 volts for the LCD and another one that generates the plus and minus 8 volts for the RS-232. And of course, you can't have any computer system without a little bit of blue logic which we have here. Now that we know how our Mosu board's laid out, let's have a closer look at those leaking capacitors. Well, this is hard to see on the camera, but looking at the board here around the capacitors, I can see right here there's a little crustiness. Over in this area there is. And it looks like around the base of this capacitor there might be a little leakage so I'm thinking we're probably due for a recap of this board. Even though that's not my normal MO for most computers, some of them really need it. Oh yeah. There is a little bit of discoloration right around here from this cap leaking. So what I like to do for boards like this is I'll make myself a capacitor map. And I'll get a picture of the board from the service manual that has the location of all these capacitors. Then I'll go through and measure the diameter of each one, the height of each one, the pitch of the leads, its working voltage and capacitance and temperature rating. And I will attempt to match these up as close as possible with new parts of a good manufacturer like Nichicon or Panasonic. Now, parts of this age, these 
kind of really miniature capacitors weren't as good as the normal electrolytics of this age. Like on Commodore 64s, you very rarely have problems. These smaller ones, yeah, you know, when they first came out, these do tend to leak more. I thought before we go ahead and pop in a new set of capacitors, we'll measure the voltages and then we can compare those two after the capacitors are replaced. So I got everything set up in kind of a minimum configuration to do that. Just using the 9CAD battery here, which I just found out from the person who was kind enough to donate this, it is only a few years old, so it still should be fine. So I'm just going to keep using it. We'll go ahead and turn the power on. We'll measure the 5 volts at the 5 volt test point here, and we get 5.06. If we measure here on C2, which is kind of right at the start of that switching mechanism that generates the 7 volts, we only have about 5.1 volts. And if we measure at C1, where we should see 7 volts, we only have about 4.9 volts. So there is definitely something wrong here. So we'll go ahead and get these capacitors replaced and see if that helps it out. One thing I would like to mention is that when the capacitors leak like this and they get all crusty, it's very difficult to try to desolder those because this oxide and salts and everything that's formed on here from the acid from the capacitors has a much higher melting temperature than the solder would. So by the time you get this hot enough to melt, you've probably overheated everything. So I'm going to use the fiberglass pin here. Just scratch these up a little bit like this and I'll clean them up with some IPA so we can get down to more of the bare solder so we can desolder those. The first step in the recap process is to use the fiberglass pen to clean that crusty buildup off of all the solder joints. Then we'll clean off all the mess we made with a cotton swab dipped in alcohol. Before attempting to remove the capacitors, I added a little paste flux to each joint and then added a little fresh solder to each joint, which will really help in the removal process. Given the corroded nature of the solder joints, I decided to use the walking method to remove the capacitors. This is where you heat each leg one at a time and slowly push the capacitor in the opposite direction. This will slowly walk each leg out of the board one at a time. After the capacitors are removed, then we're on to the process of making sure that each joint is very clean. We'll add a little more paste flux, a little more solder, suck the solder out with a solder sucker, and repeat the process as needed. Nearby vias should also be inspected very closely. You can also have the corrosion leach into those, so you need to clean those off and suck the solder out and add some new solder just like we did for the capacitor holes. Well, we've got our board all ready for a new set of capacitors. I have the capacitor map I made up, all nicely color-coded, part numbers and whatnot. This is in the description down below. And got some capacitors. I always like writing the model number and location number of where the capacitors go. When I first get these in, it makes it a lot easier later, and then I can compare this to my map and pop them right in place. Now we're ready to start the recapping. I've got my first set of capacitors set out, and I've got my capacitor map handy. These were the closest capacitors I get to what was originally in the board, and I just need to bend the leads back in a little bit to make them fit. Then we'll just pop them into place and double check to make sure that the polarity is correct. After all of those capacitors are inserted, I'll tip the board up and splay the legs out a little bit to keep them in place while I'm soldering. Now I'm going to add just a little dab of paste flux to each pad before I begin soldering. The next step is soldering, of course. I'll solder one leg by pushing the capacitor up against the board and then I'll solder the other leg. And then we want to give everything a thorough cleaning with some Q-tips and alcohol 
And I also like using a toothbrush and then I'll put a dry rag over it and kind of brush over the rag to soak up all the alcohol. And then we'll give everything a good inspection under the lighted magnifier and touch up any solder joints that need it. We also want to make sure that we clean the top side of the board as well. While I was at it, I replaced the one electrolytic capacitor that was on the expansion unit. We'll look more at the expansion unit in the next video. So we have everything ready to check voltages again. Let's turn it on. I heard our Roger beep there. I'll check the 5 volt test point. We have 5.06 volts. And now we'll check on C1 where we should have about 7 volts for the LCD voltage. You notice we have about 8.1 volts there and you might think, well, that's way too high. But remember, we're measuring this with the multimeter. We're not seeing all the little bumps and the unevenness to this signal. This is a charge pump generated voltage, so it's not very smooth. And if we were to take a look at this on the oscilloscope, we'd see all those bumps and everything. So our average voltage is about 7 volts. So this is fine. Let's take a look at our LCD and see if that looks better. What do you think? Hey, check this out. We've got a full range of adjustment on our LCD now. And it looks really good. This does have an option ROM in it, Ski Rider, as well as the normal things that you would see in our normal menu. Excellent. We have our LCD back. At this point, I think the thing to do is go ahead and put the Mozu board back in the bottom cover so we can get the printer hooked up and test that. The cassette we can pull out and work on separately, so that should be fine. And we'll probably want to take a look at the belt that's in there at a later time. We've got the Mozu board mounted back in our bottom enclosure. Before I put that in there, I took some mild cleanser in a rag and I walked down the inside and outside of the enclosure. It was already pretty clean and it wasn't until then that I noticed that this thing is actually painted. You can kind of get an idea of that from the texture. But you can see there's a difference between the inside and outside color. And that makes sense because I've also seen these in a silver color. So I guess they just painted them whichever color. I'm not sure if the silver were the first ones and then they switched to the white or vice versa. Or if it depended on the region in which they were sold. You notice I have not remounted the printer here. Uh, that's because there is a spot on it I would like to grease up. Let's have a look at that. Here is our printer. One thing I've already done is take the mild cleaner. This is just some formula 409 in a little spray bottle, but any standard mild cleaner like that will do. And I wiped it down and I wiped down the little rubber feed roller here. Uh, you want to be careful on the types of rubber that's often used for feed rollers, platens, uh, that type of thing can actually be damaged by using alcohol, so I just suggest a mild cleaner. Otherwise, everything on this printer looks really good. Uh, there's still a little soft grease up in this area. And I noticed that on the bottom here, we have this pin in a slot arrangement, some sort of cam. And you can just see down inside of there, you can see that little bit of blue shininess. That is actually a reed switch, so there must be a magnet mounted on here somewhere that triggers that reed switch as some type of positional feedback. But I want to put just a little bit of grease in that slot. It won't take a lot. I have a little dab of grease here. I'm just going to put a tiny bit in that slot. The slot continues on around this way, so I'm trying to reach under here and get some down in there. Then I will take the cotton bud into this and just wipe off this excess that's on the outside of this roller. 
Got our base unit back out here. I did not tighten this screw because it's actually used for the printer as well. So I'll get him the rest of the way out of there. And I'll pop the printer back down in place. Remember old screws gone into plastic. Go counterclockwise to start with. Till you feel the screw pop. There it goes. What you're doing is you're letting the screw align into the existing threads. So you're not cutting new threads. This is the type of connector that has little ears that you lift up on. Eh. To release it. Carefully push that down in there until it's seated all the way, and then push down on the ears. I found there's still ribbons available for this guy, so I've ordered some because the ribbon that was in it is shot. And luckily, the same paper rolls that are used in the Sharp CE150 uh, pocket computer printer also fit this. So we've got paper too. One other thing I've noticed is that there seems to be some dust between the LCD and the underside of this plastic. So I think I'll try to pull the LCD out of here and clean it up. And if I had some plastic polish, I would go ahead and polish these fine scratches out. But I don't have any right now, so I'll have to do that later. To pull this LCD out, we'll just need to undo the ribbon cable, undo this board, and remove these four screws. So oh, again, the connector has ears. Release the ears. Pull the ribbon out. And we'll go ahead and get this connector board out of here. This goes to the micro cassette slash cartridge port. Okay. Oh, I was wondering why that felt like I was unplugging it. It's because the micro cassette's still in there, and I was, in fact, unplugging it. Okay, then we've got four screws in the corner here. Let's see. There we go. Let's go to sneak it up like this. Now we've got our LCD out. Oh, it's interesting. You can see there's like a crease and a little wrinkle here in the polarizing film. That we're not going to be able to do anything about. And you can see some of the driver chips here and here. It took a lot of stuff to drive even a small LCD like this back in the day. Oh yeah, I can see. You can't really see that on camera, but I can see the dust that's on here in person. So what I'll do is just clean the dust off of here and off of this plastic part on the bottom and then put it back together. Well, another thing I just noticed is that this little metal plate comes out easily, as does the plastic. How convenient is that? Now, I really wish I had the plastic polish, so I could polish this up when it was out of there. At least this makes it easier to clean it. Before popping this guy back together, I wanted to point out I fixed the missing feet. Remember there was two knobbly feet diagonally like this? Well, I took those off and I stuck them both on the top. And then I used a couple of feet uh, down here that I had on hand. These are the type that I use on Commodore 64. I just had to trim down a little of the excess around the edges of the black foot there, the, the part that's kind of flat. And everything worked fine. To stick these guys back down, I used some of this which is great. It is double-sided tape that is oh, just about as thick as normal cellophane tape. I think it's probably similar stuff to what's on the back of these to begin with. Anyhow, got feet on there. We need to close this guy back up and try it out. Well, let's see here. I think we need to set this up like this. So we have our cables here to hook up. And don't forget to put in this plate like that. Okay, 
And on these connectors, they have the ears. So we pull the ears out. Slip the ribbon in there. Until it's all the way seated. And push the ears down. Just like that. To make this easier on myself, rotate it like this. And once again, we'll make sure this one is slipped up. This is for the uh, cartridge unit slash cassette connector. Pop that down in there and push down on the ears. Okay. I think it just kind of goes like so. Pops right together. All right, how about that? That wasn't too hard, was it? Should have the screws here. And that looks like way too many screws, so I forgot to put some in. Oh no. Some of these, the shorter ones, are for the expansion unit. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six is for the expansion. Seven is for the outside of this guy. Oh, I was scared there for a second. That's yeah, kind of a cruel joke you can play on a coworker if you're in a place where you repair things. You just take some extra little parts or screws and throw in their pile of stuff when they're working on something and when they get done they get it all put back together and they have this pile of screws left over they will drive themselves crazy not knowing what those are from unless they're very good and then they'll realize that they're not from what they took apart especially if they don't match but not that i'm suggesting that you subject some person to that but it is kind of funny i've had it done to me Sometimes when you're in the business of fixing stuff, people bring you things like that that they've pre-taken apart. And even though you put it all back together, there are parts left over that you don't know if they actually pulled out of some secret recess on that machine or if they were from something completely different. Okay. Hopefully I remembered to connect the battery. I think I did, but I'm only about 50% sure. I was just noticing that there's these threaded holes, which are for the expansion unit brackets. No, the expansion unit brackets are for the screw holes are here. This has four threaded holes on the bottom, which still have paint inside them, so I don't think they've ever been used. But that would make it seem like there was something that was designed to sit here and be screwed down, maybe to like a bracket to fasten this to something. Oh, that's kind of curious. I wonder what that was for. Well, I've got it back together now. Let's give it a try. So what do you say we turn this thing on and see what happens? Alrighty, we got our Roger Beep and it gives us our menu. Now, normally you would only have these first three items, control initialize, monitor, and basic. Ski writer is that extra option ROM that we have in there that's in the normally open socket. So that was really nice of the person that donated this to leave that in there. Control initialize is kind of like a soft reset. You just press the control and at button and you can set the time and date. So we could say it is Month, month, 01, 22, I bet it won't recognize the date. Let's see, 21, hour, hour, 13, 25, zero, zero. Well, it seemed to accept that. 
Now, interestingly enough, monitor is a machine language monitor, or a memory monitor. You can go and poke around with the memory. And two takes you into basic. Just like this. Of course, it's Microsoft basic. And it's saying that program one is occupying zero bytes right now. Of course, you know, we have to write a basic program to test every computer that has basic. So here you go. Now, usage wise, you know, form factor, size, keyboard, all of that works really good. And this is a very well built unit. Uh, I noticed while working on this, you know, compare this to something similar like the TRS-80 Model 100. This is built much better. It's more of a professional class device where the uh, Model 100 was definitely a consumer class build. Although the Model 100 works great, it's lasted all these years, it has a fantastic keyboard. The design of it, the construction is definitely more consumer class. This, on the other hand, the way the uh, circuit board is laid out in the construction, uh, the circuit board layout is like something you would see today as far as the spacing, the pad size, things like that. It had to be very expensive to build in the early 1980s. And, you know, considering at the time that a portable computer was something like an SX64 or a Compact or K-Pro, this thing is amazing. It would run for 50 hours or so on a single charge. And it has a built-in printer and micro cassette. And it came with 16K of RAM in the base unit, which was actually a lot. The Model 100, when it first came out, came with 4K. So I think we've reached a good spot to stop this video. We've got the machine refurbished back in operation. Uh, I've ordered a new ribbon to replace this really sad one. Not only is it all faded and nasty looking here, but it no longer whines. So we'll get some ribbon in. We'll be able to check the printer. I've got the paper I mentioned before. We can pop a micro cassette in and check that. And I'll also get a belt ordered so we can replace the belt on this thing. And we'll also dig into the expansion and take a look inside, see what makes it tick, that type of thing. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this look at this Epson HX20. It's certainly an interesting computer, and I'm glad we were able to get that dim LCD fixed up. Now that we can see what's going on, I look forward to using this and learning more about it. In an upcoming episode, We'll go through the micro cassette recorder and get that refurbished as well as have a look inside the expansion unit to see what makes it tick. And we'll also try out a program I found that simulates the external disk drive and video unit using a regular PC. It'll be interesting to see how that operates, especially since the video unit was never actually produced. Say, if you're a subscriber, thank you. I really appreciate it. It helps out a lot. It's very encouraging to see that subscriber count grow, and it helps other people find the channel as well. If you're not a subscriber, well, just look down below. You'll see a rectangular box that says subscribe. Click on that dude, and you'll be subscribed to the channel. It's free, it's easy, and it's painless. Once you've subscribed, you'll notice a bell-shaped icon. Well, if you click on that guy, YouTube will be nice enough to let you know just as soon as I post a new video. I'd also like to take a moment to say thanks to everyone who helps support the Hate Bird channel through Patreon and other means such as donating this nice HX20. It's really appreciated and you're keeping this channel going. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Just leave them in the comments section down below. Well, until next time, bye.